And now we're going to start our afternoon with a panel focused on indoor agriculture and the future of self-feeding cities. To lead this discussion, it's a pleasure to turn to Dr. Haitao Lee, who is the chair of the Department of Supply Chain and Analytics here at UMSL. Thanks, John. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our panel session on indoor agriculture and the future of self-feeding cities. Indoor agriculture, also known as indoor farming or controlled environment agriculture, has so many potentials and advantages, which are all well known. For example, high yields, year-round productivity, high quality of food, and shortened distribution lead time. And it certainly has the potential to transform the way we do agriculture and support the vision of the future of self-feeding cities. Today, we have an excellent panel of experts from both industry and academia. Sitting on my left is Mr. Thad Simmons from the Yield Lab. Mr. Tony White from Three Rivers Farm. Mr. Tyrin Lewis from Hiru Urban Farming. And Dr. Jejun Lee from UNKC. A little bit more about myself. I'm the department chair of supply chain and analytics department at AMSO. I also run my recently launched uh, research lab, at Advanced Supply Chain Analytics. We offer the most comprehensive supply chain program in the state of Missouri. My research area focuses on the use of data and analytics uh, to address a wide range of decision needs uh, under the broad umbrella of supply chain. My research in food and ag supply chain focus on the big theme to address multiple performance metrics of the complex food system. That includes efficiency, safety, resilience, especially as we think about all kinds of risks and disruptions as we went through a couple of years ago. Um, equity, thank you, Lee, for mentioning that very important metric, and sustainability. I want to share with you briefly three of my ongoing uh, research projects um, in food and ag sector. The first one is about the study of indoor farming, the economics, and the supply chain design to help an indoor farming startup to scale and grow. We, this is a project funded by Missouri Agriculture Small Business Development Authority. We conducted a case study using the model and decision support tool we developed to address, first of all, what kind of crop or crop portfolio should an indoor farming uh, startup to grow? And secondly, beyond production and the issue of yields, we address the food distribution issues in terms of how to design the food supply chain to help a startup indoor farming company to grow and to be sustainable. Second project I've been working on, funded by the UM System South Africa Exchange Program, um, is, is to help uh, local, farm, local farms in the South Africa, in particular the Cape Town region, to help them better plan for their farm uh, production. So again, here we address not only the, their production needs, but also the seasonality of production. What crops to grow at what time? Uh, we took, again, the supply chain perspective to bring in the data about the market, the price, and seasonality of those factors into consideration. So the two farms we worked with, one of them is called Marnigingi Foundation, which started as a non-for-profit organization using their community gardens to, to serve as a way to provide employment opportunity to disabilities in that region. But over time, they really had, had been struggled to be economically sustainable. So I'm going back to uh, Cape Town this summer to report uh, the progress of the project. Very exciting about that. The third project uh, I want to briefly share with you is um, my project, uh, I'm part of the research team on this NSF-funded research project on using state-of-the-art sensors mm -hmm. to detect uh, salmonella contamination in the poultry industry. So my role in this project focuses on develop 
what we call decision support system that builds upon this integrated data environment. We call it multi, multi-source and multi-sectorial data environment that will collect data from sensors, from existing geospatial database, as well as some existing database from organizations such as CDC to provide the data environment. On top of that, we envision an integrated decision support system that embeds all three components of analytics, that is descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive or optimization to provide decision support to ensure food safety and equity. All right, next I will turn to Mr. Thad Siemens to introduce himself. Yes, well, thank you. Um, hi, Tao. So I'm Thad Simons with the Yield Lab. Uh, we started the Yield Lab in 2015 here in St. Louis, initially as an ag tech accelerator program, uh, just taking in a few companies each year. It's amazing how the space has grown since 2015. Um, there weren't any other uh, active investors in ag tech back in that time period. So we had a lot of innovation going on here, a lot of support for startups and other fields, but there wasn't really anything that was happening in, in the ag field at the time. Uh, today, of course, is very active all over the world, and we've also grown beyond St. Louis. We now have a fund in Europe, uh, Latin America, and in Asia Pacific, and we have investments all across the world. I think we have now about 90 different investments across those different geographies. Uh, and Carlos actually tells you how we have attracted some companies to the St. Louis area. So we're always happy when that works out. Um, and we were happy that it could work out working uh, with him and the team from AWA. Uh, in our very first cohort, actually, we had a company from, from Argentina. So all the way back in 2015. And that fellow liked us so much that he actually went back from here to Argentina and founded the Alab Latin America, which is now in Argentina, Brazil, Chile, and just this year in Mexico meaning they have partners located in all those areas. So that continues to grow on the fund side of things. We did hear an appeal to the St. Louis community for more investment dollars at later stages, and I think that's really true. That's a really important thing that we need to even more bring to the attention of our, our leadership here in our community, that um, we're not as strong as we need to be, especially in that later stage of investing. But one of the things we've been looking at very closely from the Yield Lab, uh, both from an investment point of view as well as where I'm rep representing our nonprofit today, the Yield Lab Institute, is really looking to see how we can actually um, look for what is working and what's not working in this area of controlled environment agriculture. So what are the models out there that are successful and which are the ones that have not been? Uh, we have, um, we're actively working with UMSL right now to try and create a center of excellence that will be focused on not only technology and innovation, but more specifically on business models and some of the um, points that Hightown made with regard to what can make these successful businesses. So that's, that's in progress. We hope to um, have a feasibility study done in the next few months and be able to really start. But even today, um, I think they're very willing and I'm sold to have a conversation with you if you're working at all in this field and you feel that your business could actually be benefited from being here on this beautiful campus. There's space enough for you here. We're not looking to try and create um, a huge institution in itself. What we're looking for is being a way to connect a lot of other people who are already playing in this space, whether it goes from the Danforth Center or from Bayer or from whoever uh, at the universities. Uh, that's what we're trying to do in terms of a center of excellence, to connect some of those dots that today we think are, we have the power and the resources here and the connections. We heard a lot this morning about the connections that exist here. Um, but bringing a little bit more of a focus on the business part of it, I think would really be impactful. So I think that's uh, enough about me. I think the Yield Lab uh, will continue to, uh, to grow globally, and we will continue to uh, support the work around a CEA. Thank, Thank you, you Seth. Yeah. Let's move to uh, Tony. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tony White, and um, 
nine years ago, if you would have mentioned to me that I'd be speaking to a group of people that work on, in, in the industry about farming, I would have laughed you right out of the, the building. Um, my background is Yellow Pages, and I don't know if many of you are old enough to recognize that <laughs> medium, but that's where I spent 15 years of, of my life really understanding um, how to interact with businesses, how to interact with customers, learning how to listen and then solve problems. So here we are nine years later, by accident, I fell into the opportunity to grow some produce, just right down the street at the Creve Coeur Airport. It's about five miles away from here. And uh, the first year, it was a complete failure, no success at all. Uh, that's the year that the airport had the tornado that went through, and it, it came right across the farm, the farm that I was leasing land from, had hogs, they got out, they got into the garden and everything. At the end of, the, at the end of that season, there was just a couple of plates of peppers. That was, that's all that we had that was left. So, you know, I'm a pretty competitive person and, uh, you know, the farmer that owned the land kind of kept ribbing me and he said, well, why don't we build a fence around the property? Well, that fence turned out to be the launch of a new business. At the end of that season, uh, everything I put into the ground grew and, um, I had everybody in the neighborhood canning mustard or making mustard out of jalapeno peppers, you know, out of wax, banana wax peppers. We made watermelon jelly. You know, the, the point is we just kept having a lot of success with these items that the person that was involved with said, if we can't eat it in three days, take it across the street and sell it. And uh, that happened to be a, a very prestigious restaurant from the hill that opened up a new location called Trattoria Marcella. That July I showed up with my two children and we had 800 pounds of heirloom tomatoes. And just ironically, I don't know if many of you who live in the Clayton area, but there's another restaurant called Cafe Napoli. He happened to be dining next door and those two gentlemen got into a fight over the tomatoes that night that I was selling. <laughs> and I looked at my kids and I said, okay, I think we got something here. So uh, Steve Komarak is the person that owns Trattoria Marcella. And, uh, you know, he wrote a check for $800 that night. I gave it to my kids. I said, there's your school clothes. We're good to go. Let's make this happen. As the Piatesso, Piatesso family was leaving, I said, I'll see you on Tuesday with some more tomatoes. And uh, today, um, I'm called Tony Tomato in the community. Um, <laughs> my, the reason they call me that is because I have figured out how to bring a red tomato that's regionally grown into the marketplace to my customers. Just by listening and answering to the, what, what they were asking for is what we're able to do. You know, my business today also, we, I import mushrooms from Oregon, Europe. Uh, we have free range chickens that we bring in throughout the course of the season. And, um, you know, recently, you know, I was appointed to the uh, state committee for the USDA Farm Services. So, you know, I'm at the table where there's a lot of farm opportunities, appeals that are taking place. And having you know, an urban experience, I'm able to bring that perspective to the table right next to the person who has 100,000 chickens that he's producing for Tyson every six weeks, right? Um, so it, it's been a very interesting experience in this world. Um, you know, now working with the USDA, we decided to um, move the farm out to Defiance Ridge Wineries. And behind Defiance Ridge Winery, we've created an a incredible showpiece garden that's taking place. Um, as of Wednesday, by hand, we put in our 3,000th tomato, and um, there's probably four or 5,000 other plants that are out there in the field, and we've got another 1,400 more to go. And um, it doesn't look like we're slowing down. It seems like this industry is still creating more opportunities, especially as we're here to talk about indoor growing and you know I'll share some of my experiences and how I'm currently utilizing that to make my business thrive in the area okay, Thank you. okay. let's move down to mm -hmm. Tyreen um, just like Tony Tomato I didn't always know that I was going to be a farmer so um, I started as a PE teacher and a health teacher um, I started farming um, I got into first of all I'm a fifth generational farmer um, my family from Texas they've been farming for um, for decades, right? So um, I got in the farm because I actually wanted access to sustainable food in my community. Um, I kind of was forced into it, actually. Um, you know, um, you know, in the St. Louis area, uh, we known for food deserts, food apartheid, or whatnot, whatever term you want to use. 
but some of us that do have um, a grocery store close to our community, it's still substantially different from the uh, suburban counterparts. So when I went into the store, I saw it wasn't a good, um, a good um, choices for me. So I was like, okay, I'm turning to a field trip. I went to Midtown, uh, but like Central West End, went to their grocery store. I was like, okay, a little better. So then I went out to Clayton. I was like, wow, you know, they got, they got everything. You close your eyes and pick some stuff up, you got a good batch. Then I went to West County. And I was like, they had fruit I never heard of at the time. You know, <laughs> jackfruit, starfish. I'm like, what is this stuff? I'm like, okay. So I said, okay, I'm turning this. I'm going to start growing food in buckets in my backyard. Started growing food in buckets. Um, I'm big on manifestation. So I had a vacant lot across the street from my house. I sat there. I was like, okay, how would it look if I had some fresh food over there? Um, something that our neighborhood can um, eat. So, you know what I mean? Even to the, minute, to the minute detail, like how the wind's going to feel through my hair and my arm, how it's going to smell, things of that nature. So stuff started falling in place for me. Um, I started reaching out to the community. Now I tell you, this community I was staying in, I was over there for five years, no one knew who the heck I was. I mean, I mean, no one even said anything to me. Um, I started growing food, everybody started talking to me, you know? <laughs> so I'm like, okay, this, I might got something going here. So I start, you know, talking around the community, passing out flyers, things of that nature. Man, my biggest naysayer, Mr. Jenkins, he told me, Man, how are you going to be a farmer? Uh, you can't grow food. And like, in July, I want to see you out there. So I'm like, dang, what's wrong with him? He mean. So the next day, he was out there with his shovel. I'm like, okay. So that's how this play out. All right. So, um, so long story short, so that happened. That was 10,000 square feet. Now we're in the present. Um, I got accumulation like three acres um, across St. Louis. Um, I'm at Confluence Farms in uh, unincorporated St. Louis, which is fluorescent. Uh, it's a 240-acre property. Um, I got about two acres on that property. Um, I grow, my number one thing is uh, watermelon. I got the best watermelon in St. Louis. Um, I don't say that, the customers say that. Um, uh, so I got watermelon, I do Asian um, greens, so I do bok choy, tat soy, we do sweet potato. Not as many as tomatoes as him, but I do tomatoes. Uh, I do cucumbers. Uh, my son, he makes pickles. My daughter, she makes um, hot sauce. Um, so uh, that's what we do. But my most important thing I like doing, um, I do outreach. So. Um, I got a nonprofit side as well. So I created an agriculture curriculum where I go to different schools. It's aligned with the Missouri State Standards. And we teach about the history of the crop, how it's important to you, um, you know, things of that nature. Um, I got former school grants where I have um, minority chefs come out to the school. We teach them how to, so a big thing is teaching people how to prepare this food, how to cook it, right? So we teach them how to do that. Uh, uh, we have uh, herbalists come in, teach them how to make um, medicinal tinctures, things of that nature. Uh, I'm on the urban county committee with him. With the, he's on the state committee. I'm on the urban county committee with uh, with the FSA. With um, I never wanted to get into policy or, or politics, but I guess I am. And you know, I'm in this space, so I'm part of the Young National Farmers Coalition. We went to um, D.C. in March for a fly-in to talk about the farm bill to get the urban voice heard in that space. I'm on the Missouri Board of Directors with the Missouri Farmers Union as well. So uh, so you know I'm in. The, I went and met a few. Um, um, policymakers and politicians and things of that nature to talk about that as well. Um, what else we got going on? Um, we feed the homeless as well. Uh, so everything is like outreach based and also uh, we selling stuff as well. So um, like I say, we do CSAs. Went on sale today, by the way. Um, we started in July. Uh, every five we sell, we donate to a family in need. Uh, we also, um, I sell to local chefs here. Uh, I, sold, I sell to City Greens. It's located in uh, Manchester here in St. Louis. And I, I also sell the North Sierra Food Hub. So I think the future is, um, we're gonna talk about that later too, is um, food hubs and community-ran grocery stores, I believe. Um, COVID was like a, a blessing in disguise, really. Uh, when that happened, everybody got more, um, I guess, um, health conscious. Uh, more, more people wanted local uh, food, local produce. So that kind of helped me out a lot in that space. But um, yeah, that's all for now, for right now. Yep. <clears throat> J JJ Lee, but everyone calls me JJ, so you can just call me <laughs> JJ. Uh, I'm a professor in Earth and Environmental Sciences at uh, UMKC. So I'm not from St. Louis area, but then uh, I visit St. Louis literally every other week right now <laughs> for this kind of meetings and also for my son's soccer games. <laughs> Busy daddy. Uh, so uh, uh, I, got, uh, I got involved in this. Um, urban agriculture research uh, from my research in uh, Africa. So uh, in the morning session, uh, Dr. Schwartz shows that the situation in Africa and uh, one of the areas was Lake Chad area. And then that was my research area for 10 years. 
And so during that the research that I installed, I'm a hydrologist, especially for groundwater. So I installed some uh, monitoring session sensors, the very first real-time monitoring stations in uh, Central and West Africa. But then uh, after a couple of years, then uh, we started to maintain those sensors. So the battery was out, and then even they didn't have a nine volt battery in the region. So sending those nine volt battery, it cost like three, $400. And so I talked to the, one of my colleagues, what if we develop some uh, low cost sensors? So I started to work with a computer science professor to develop those uh, low cost sensors. And then to test those sensors, I contacted the local farmers. And so we installed those sensors and then uh, work with those local farmers. But then uh, I got to know about situations and the struggles they had back then. And, and I found that a lot of those local growers that are located in the food desert area. So we learned that, that there is some uh, disconnection between these growers and also the residents in the food desert. So we somehow came up with some idea of how we can connect them together and then uh, make this uh, food system more sustainable. So instead of, since I'm a hydrologist, so I didn't know much about how to grow those produce and those kind of stuff. But instead, we made a team from the different um, disciplines. So we have these uh, sensor experts from the computer science and also the transportation, especially for the micro transportation, uh, Professor Carlos Sun uh, from MNU and also uh, uh, food nutrition layer. So we also look at the post-processing. So she looked at the how we can keep those produce uh, fresh and always maintain the nutrient a longer time. And also we have social economic layer to identify what kind of uh, social and economic issues we have in the city. So we got the, the funding from the National Science Foundation, uh, and that project actually started uh, right at the uh, COVID <laughs> occurs in 2020. And so throughout our focus group discussions and also the other interviews, uh, we had uh, the first hand stories from these growers and the residents. And uh, as you already saw here, I learned that uh, the farmers, they're great storytellers. <laughs> awesome storytellers. And then uh, there are many that are uh, heartbroken stories. And, but then uh, interestingly, that, um, as that Haru just mentioned, that throughout the pandemic, so I was worried that um, they might affect the grower even more. But then uh, our uh, partner grower told us that the, uh, it's opposite. Actually, they got a lot more people coming to their farms because uh, a lot of those produce are not much available at the supermarket. So they, come to, they came to those the local farms. And also, a lot of people, they wanted to learn how to grow by themselves. So uh, actually, he was happy to have more people coming to uh, their farms. But then uh, when that everything came back to normal in 2021 and 2022, people also somehow stop coming to this reason. So then uh, we wonder that how we can uh, continue to have that interaction between the growers and also the people in the food desert. So if you look at the next, show the next slide. So this is the one of the uh, result uh, we found from this project. So uh, one of the ideas was how can you connect these growers to the consumers directly? So we consider that the different, uh, like a delivery options by walking and e-bikes and e-scooters and a drone and car and trucks. And then uh, estimate the cost for the five pounds bags. And then uh, we learned that for the one mile or three mile distance, so then uh, e-scooter and e-bikes, that is the most economical options. And in other words, the growers can di directly deliver those data produced to the consumers. And then uh, we 
since this is a geography uh, <laughs> seminar, then we somehow put that, that the range on these uh, GIS maps. So as you see here, this uh, black color background map is the income level. So a dark color is the, uh, the higher income, and then a lighter blue is the, uh, the lower. And then uh, we mark that the uh, current uh, urban grower locations. And as you see here, when you set the one mile radius and three mile radius, when you have a three mile radius, it covers that the most of areas. And then when we use the one mile uh, radius, so then uh, still the empty space. So in other words, visually we can see how this uh, setup would uh, help connecting these uh, growers and consumers. So there is a very good strength by using these uh, geospatial technologies. So we can somehow talk about those things here. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, JJ. Yeah. We are facing many challenges in food and ag sector. So we have heard a lot about uh, climate change throughout the morning. So this map shows the consistent challenge of drought trend uh, in our country. Shrinking land use and decrease of natural resources, including water and soil. Food accessibility in terms of both geographic accessibility as well as nutrition accessibility from the health perspective. Equity, again, right? Where do we send the foods to? How are the population being served? Which group of population are the most vulnerable due to any kind of risks and disruption? And finally, in the midst of all these challenges, on the other hand, we have been experiencing significant food loss and waste. This map shows, heat map shows the estimate of excess food by EPA in our country, with the yellow color showing the most waste. What this, what this map does not show is the waste throughout an end-to-end -end food supply chain actually vary a lot. Okay? So um, I, can, I can share with you, in our country, in developed country like US, uh, we have significant food waste and loss at the consumer stage. Whereas in many developing countries, food and loss occurs more at the initial stages of a food supply chain. Now, all these leads to our first question to the panel. How can indoor farming and self-feeding cities cope with the challenges in food and agriculture? Shall we start? Let's start with uh, Terry and Tony. Yeah. So. Um I like this question. Um, so I, I guess I come from, from both angles on this. So like I said earlier, I believe uh, food hubs and, and uh, neighborhood ran grocery stores are the, are the future. Um, simply because, uh, like I said, through COVID, we had empty shelves everywhere, right? And a lot of them stuff are imported. Most of the food in Missouri comes from over 1,200 miles away. So we talk about Mexico, California, all those places like that. But if we had farmers locally, um, supplying these uh, these grocery stores, I think that'd be a, a better setup. For example, uh, I know we dealing with space in the cities, but um, okay, like I have like some um, some land, I will grow like one or two crops, right? Another farmer will grow one or two crops, and we all do that. And I believe um, you know, and we kind of do that kind of now with um, North Star Food Hub. Um, I know North Star Food Hub supply um, uh, meals for uh, diabetic patients with Barnes Jewish Hospital. Um, and we and I know they get stuff from me, Confluence, and a couple of other farmers in St. Louis. It's also is a community grand grocery store that's being um, open right now in Jennings, um, in Jennings as well. And they're gonna they basically doing the same model. Um, that not only do they have they're gonna be selling food, they got other services as well in there um, for the, for for the community. Like you come there and get. Um, on week services, use computer, just anything that you think an underserved community need, that building will have that, that structure will have that as well. Um, I'm looking into uh, thermal, uh, geothermal um, greenhouses as well. Um, I know I saw someone doing that in um, Nebraska. He was, he was growing um, oranges in the snow. Um, people ask me all year round, do I have produce? Um, you know, because the quality, I know in the wintertime, the quality in the grocery stores are kind of 
Um, they're not that good because, like I said, they're getting imported in. They're, they're harvesting it early so it can make it here on time. Uh, so the quality is off. So, I mean, people ask me about watermelon December. I'm like, I don't have watermelon in December. I'm sorry. Uh, we're like, don't eat, can't you see cold snow outside? But, you know, things of that nature. So um, I really think um, that's the future we're going towards. Um, we're starting to do that as now. Uh, I'm blessed to be in St. Louis, where it's a, um, they have a heavy emphasis on urban farming, just like Detroit and Kansas City as well. And um, um, I, I believe that's what we, what we're headed to. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's excellent idea. The idea of Food Hub really motivates um, uh, continuing work and research of, about the design of the food supply chain in terms of you know, how many hubs we need, right? Where shall we locate those hubs you know, to connect the growers like you with the customer, perhaps with the most vulnerable population groups as well? Tony? Okay. So I look at this question as an opportunity. Okay? Sure. Because the story that I'm able to share and back it up with the proof is that I have a red tomato that's grown regionally that I bring to my chefs all year long. Okay, now, you know, we'll, as we go later into the program, I'll, I'll show you, we'll sure. get a look into the breakdown here. But, you know, within a six hour drive of this facility right here, there's two growers that are focusing on hydroponic growing in glass houses. They're using the technology that was developed over in you know, the Netherlands, right. and they are successfully creating produce that has the same type of bricks level that I grow in the field. So this technology is here. We just have to figure out ways to train more people through the academic world so that they can recognize that there's money that they can make in this type of industry. You know, it's, it's very difficult to find a young 18 year old that wants to get out in a field and chop weeds or try to sucker a tomato plant. You're just not gonna find that anymore. But if we can ex share with them how to work within a container. You know, we have a containers less than two miles away from here that's producing in a, a container the size of three Chevy F-150 trucks, two, two acres yep. of produce, and they can churn that every, every week. So the challenge that we have with that type of technology now is getting them to understand that we don't want basil grown in a container at $18 a pound <laughs> in June, right? There you go, yeah. But my chefs will pay that in October, November, December, in January. Yep. Okay, so yeah, we're, we're right at a point where it's very exciting. I'm making a living out of indoor farming technology right now. The product that's coming out of these places. Well, and let me just say something else. I have one of my, one of my drivers is coming back from Mason City, Iowa with 700 pounds of on the vine cherry tomatoes. And that 700 pounds will be sold by Tuesday of next week through, through chefs. And the bricks level on that is at an eight or in, depending on the sunshine, because that's a challenge that we have, right? You know, right. it's getting that, you know, the, the sun to shine on the, on the greenhouse. It's at a nine, okay, so. Thank you, Tony. Mm -hmm. I, I share uh, the excitement you, you have. Mm -hmm. Certainly, um, your example of tomato is an excellent example because this is one example of perishable foods, right? right. You know, to yeah. be able to offer that mm -hmm. locally not only provides the nutrition that our population needs, but also uh, you, you, you have that trust, right? right. Yeah, people nowadays, um, many of us would like to know where um, uh, did the food we eat come from, right? That's yeah, correct. so you, mm -hmm. you build that trust and that <laughs> community support, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's, it's excellent. Yeah. Okay. yeah. All right. Shall we move to you, Thad? Yeah. Oh, sure. <clears throat> it's a little different perspective. I'm not a farmer, although my family were all farmers down in Georgia, but totally different kind of farming. I think the. Um, one thing we have here in St. Louis, you've heard of 39 North, the reason it's called 39 North is because we are actually at the 39 North latitude, which means we're in the farm belt around the world. So the sun is positioned here, <clears throat> ideally for agriculture. And so that means we have the greatest potential to be able to do more indoor sun-based farming here. Um, 
We're going to have the other versions as well. We're working to try and attract a large vertical farm to St. Louis, which we totally indoor, all LED lights and all that kind of, the model that's very typical now for what we think about as being vertical farms. But in reality, we are actually blessed to be here in this location to be able to really maximize the use of sunlight year round, as well as we are fairly blessed in having lower cost energy than most places in the country, and we have an unlimited supply of water. So we have so many advantages here to be able to ex um, exploit this kind of technology to have a more diversified farming system than we've had in the state of Missouri or in the Midwest for a long time. So that's how I look at this question. I look at it in terms of diversification of our farming. So we go back to a model where farmers are not just growing corn this year and soy soybeans next year, but actually we're growing all different kinds of crops, yeah. all different parts of the year. On this uh, indoor farming initiative, we were working with the World Wildlife Fund, and they published a paper, Why St. Louis, and that was, we had our only one in-person meeting, which was in January 2020 over at Bayer, and after that COVID, we did all the rest of the meetings on Zoom, and still we were able to attract several farms who expressed strong interest in building a facility in St. Louis, and I'm very confident that one of those will happen and will be announced later on this year. But I, that is just like it was the first step. How do we actually do that kind of a, in a way that will attract that kind of technology to us? And they will come here largely because of the market, because of the reasons I said in terms of water and energy cost. Definitely some local funding sources that were helpful to this uh, happening. But then I think what allows us to do is to continue on from that to think about how do we not think of this as only as being urban farming, definitely is for, it is, the purpose needs to be for urban consumers, because that's where most consumption is happening. But it can be actually beneficial to farmers all across our region to be able to diversify their revenue streams and not be dependent on two commodities that go up and down out of the control. And then you build these relationships like you've heard that you have then as a direct relationship with the farmer and then the consumer, whether that's through a restaurant or food hubs or however right. those channels get built. So that's how I look at this question. Now, other places, there'll be other kind of systems. So the company that's coming uh, has also built one of these things in United Emirates. Well, they don't have, they have a lot of seawater, but they don't have really fresh water. They have a lot of sun, but they don't have, uh, and I suppose the energy cost is probably pretty low too. But what they need there is really just any kind of local food production. So this will be different. The answer to this question will be different based upon where you are. Thank you, Thad, for your uh, insights. I, I really like your point. Uh, indoor farming, uh, most likely, is to add, is to diversify the, uh, uh, the, the ag growing system we already have. Uh, so one, one of the findings through my MASPA indoor farming project, what we find was clearly from the economic perspective, uh, it's, it's most likely that companies would have a portfolio of growing methods, right? With traditional, you know, uh, greenhouse, for example, in combination with vertical farms, because um, they do have complementary strengths and disadvantages. So that, that certainly pops up uh, the, the issue I briefly mentioned earlier in terms of crop portfolio, right? What crops to grow, in what method, and at what time? JJ, please. Oh, yeah. yeah. So uh, I think that uh, for these questions, uh, I'd like to address these uh, self-feeding cities. So um, COVID really uh, gave us a very good lesson about this food security. And um, so uh, at the beginning that uh, the cities and also counties, uh, they actually provided a lot of the, the food pantry, those are boxed food to the um, local people. But then uh, when we had an interview with those uh, residents and also those, uh, the people uh, having those kind of uh, city support, uh, they said that uh, much of them actually they couldn't consume because of various reasons. There's some religious reason, 
there are some health reasons. And interestingly, the people who get those kind of uh, the pantry food, uh, they're mostly low income. So parents usually, uh, they work day and night. So at home, mostly uh, the children stay, stay at home and they have no idea how to cook. So even though they receive all those kind of uh, the support, really didn't help much. And that's why I think this uh, having this indoor farming and also urban growers within the city uh, really uh, play a very important role to fill that gap and connect them together. And uh, as you also mentioned that um, they really want to learn how to cook. <laughs> it's a very surprising uh, response. Uh, they said, I, I really want to learn how to cook. And instead of buying that the McDonald's or those uh, the, the, the cheap uh, uh, the food, I really want to have some healthy food. They want to have the healthy food, mm -hmm. but they don't know how to cook. They don't know where to get them. And so I think that uh, this uh, indoor farming and also the urban growing in general, I think can play a very important role for this uh, urban food security. And for the indoor farming, I think that is a very good option, especially when you consider that the climate change. So uh, in Kansas City, uh, we, we have more like a mixture of small scale indoor growing and also the outdoor growing using that uh, high tunnels. And um, indoor growing, even uh, I also run a project uh, for the veterans. So we uh, run the container farms, so I help them to grow that the basils and uh, mushrooms uh, using containers. And, but then uh, outdoor growing, uh, some growers, they 100% rely on their rainwater. So they have some uh, rain barrels, so they collect all the water, all the rains following, on, uh, dropping on that high tunnels. So when they had a good rain, then uh, that is good enough on the water to uh, grow throughout the year. But then uh, during that the drought period, they don't have enough water to grow. So uh, this uh, indoor farming could be a good alternative options in that case. And also uh, I see the increasing number of restaurant owners, they also start to grow by themselves. Like some of the restaurants in Kansas City, they have an aquaponic system with the tilapia fish. In, the, in their basement. So they grow that the basils and the lettuce for their uh, cooking. So definitely there is a change of the recognition of the uh, indoor farming and the self-feeding uh, system. So this would be a very good chance to talk about all that. Yeah. Thanks, JJ. Yeah, especially your points mentioning the need to connect, to consider the needs of consumers, right? Really on the social side, of the grand challenge. Yeah, thank you for that. Let's move on. Um, we, are, we are here in St. Louis. Why, why St. Louis, right? What, what are the opportunities uh, especially suitable for um, indoor farming as well as self-feeding cities in our region? Um, let's start with you, Seth. Yeah. Well, I partially answered this question before by our location. And as I mentioned, um, if you go if you look at the World Wildlife Fund's uh, um, website, you'll see they published this paper about St. Louis. It published about a, a year ago with regards to this exact question and why we should be able to have a support. In this case, we're talking about a large scale vertical farm of the typical kinds we think of that have not generally been that successful. Most of them have gone bankrupt. So that's a, back to the business model and what are we growing and what's it costing and that kind of thing. And whether we're growing 18 hour basil in the time of the year when we don't need that kind of um, growing system. So, but, we, but, we, but the facility is there, so it has to grow something else. So it has to be thought through all the way through and the whole planning for as any business would during the course of their whole year. But there's another study they've done. I'm not sure if it's published or not yet, but it was looking at the next California and so their view is California growing system model um, doesn't work anymore because lack of water, um, labor cost, energy cost. 
But there is a place in the country they have identified, this is the World Wildlife Fund, has identified as being ideal for California kind of production. And that happens to be the Boot Hill of Missouri, eastern uh, Arkansas, and western Tennessee. So that region, which is just like what, 100 miles south of us, 200 miles, so that region has uh, rivers that are coming through, yep. rolling hills. We know the vineyards do well here, and there's no reason not to think that these other kinds of production would do well in our part of the world. And they have done the research and the technical research to support that analysis. What I haven't seen is any effort by our more farming communities or our university communities or our um, state communities to say, yes, we should be investing in those kind of production systems. So I think it's another opportunity for us, again, back to this point of diversification, <clears throat> and getting production closer to the markets. If we can get the production closer to the markets, it'll be better for the farmers. They'll have less of the ups and downs and no water this year and continuous drought situations. I mean, this year there's plenty of water in California, but that's not a long term. That's long term, it's not gonna be enough water. And so we have, I think, a lot of opportunities right now, right here in the St. Louis, broader St. Louis area to be able to have a very diverse, very impactful, large, high value agricultural production. If I ask you the question, and I'll give you the answer, the largest by value, by value, exporter of food in the world is the United States. Who is number two? By value. Netherlands. 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 So a tiny country produces so much high value food in greenhouses that they can be number two. Flowers, that's part of the course, but anyway. I think you get the point. So it can, and we can create that kind of business here in our region. Thank you, sir. JJ, could you oh, yeah. come up? Yeah. So, uh, as I mentioned, that I now I come to St. Louis really every other <laughs> week. And, uh, but what I observe is uh, there is a very strong recognition about this uh, indoor growing in the St. Louis area. So when I search up about this indoor growing, you can easily see that the first few articles, they're all related to the uh, indoor growing in St. Louis area as well. So that kind of recognition, I think is very much important because when people realize that uh, this indoor growing is really needed, uh, the system for this urban food security, then definitely there will be a more su financial support and also um, uh, uh, the cities, uh, they're gonna also support to grow that the business. So then uh, they're gonna uh, find a way to have some better regulations and zonings and all those challenges can be easily uh, taken care of. So that's what I found in the St. Louis area whenever I come here and then whenever I do some search up on this indoor growing, always uh, St. Louis is one of the main cities into that direction. So, uh, and, uh, and also uh, I learned that these uh, geospatial technologies in St. Louis area, uh, I can also see that change as well because yeah, my son, that <laughs> they will play soccer, uh, he's high schooler, <laughs> junior, so we are doing this at campus visit. And yeah, the Amsel and also uh, St. Louis University and uh, all those uh, university, they really address this uh, geospatial technology. And as I show in my slide, uh, when we uh, develop these uh, food security issues, Visualization really uh, appealed to the people. So this uh, geospatial technology and also this, uh, the food security can really go along well uh, as a, a person studying those other subjects. Uh, so I think that the St. Louis has a very strong position to tackle that uh, both uh, subject together. So uh, I, 
Whenever I come here, I'm really impressed. And then uh, even from all these discussions, yeah, I always learn something. So uh, I think that St. Louis has uh, great opportunities. And of course, that uh, I'm in Kansas City. So I can also deliver all this knowledge and what I learned to the Kansas City. Because Kansas City, they also try to address this food security issue. And I talk with the uh, uh, city officials and also these uh, local people. And always, there is some good connection between the Kansas City and St. Louis so, uh, from both ends of the state of Missouri. So uh, yeah, I think that there will be a very strong opportunity. Thank you, JJ. Tony? Could you? Please. So we do have a great opportunity with indoor growing here in St. Louis. And recently, and Terrain and Ivan um, were working on it, and his whole position is based on the focus on urban agriculture. So St. Louis has really been blessed to be named one of the 17 cities across the country from the USDA as an urban hub, right? Yeah. Uh, because it's a food desert that we have here. And also the ag coast of America, um, championed by the by state development, sorry. That's okay, China. yeah, no. <laughs> and and um, so what does that look like, right? Um, we know the Dutch has been moving technology. I mean, they've, <laughs> they, they've got it. They've got the handle on it. Right. The challenge that I have with their technology mm -hmm. here is the type of product that they want to produce because everything yes. boils down to money, right? Yeah. You Absolutely. know, our customers here in the Midwest, we like a beefsteak tomato to fit on our hamburger, but we're going to have to change our thought process because, <laughs> you know, the, the Dutch, the European, they like the baguettes or smaller open face sandwiches, right? And so, mm -hmm. so we're working through that whole piece, but that's just the tomato as an opportunity that's there. You know, there's cucumbers and everything else, mm -hmm. but I think, um, one of the things that we have been really lobbying um, the committee to submit to the USDA is information to get container growing or, you know, the, how do we make shipping containers more affordable? Right now I'm seeing the cost anywhere between $175,000 to $125,000, mm. you know, for, that's a pretty big investment for, for somebody to want to, you know, try to build within the city. So we really need to come up with some type of micro loan process that make that happen because, again, in a shipping container, we're looking at two acres of, of produce that we can produce. And if somebody is growing lettuce, yeah. then in every six weeks, we're able to churn, and that's a lot of mouths that we're able to feed in the area all year long. Yeah. So that opportunity is, is there, you know. Um, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that, you know, my business is based on, you know, the 180 days that we can muster out, outdoors, but we also, you know, I also partner with a growing community that has high tunnels that are in a small facility, right? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, so October and November, you know, in December, we can still produce a tomato mm -hmm. in a high tunnel because, you know, that's there. Listening to my chefs, they said that, you know, in March, if we have three days together that, you know, maybe 68 degrees, you know, people are driving around with their convertible tops off and they're running around in shorts. You think it's the middle of the summer, right? So we have spring fever so bad here in this area. But what does that mean for, for us, you know, as a grower? Well, here's an opportunity to come up with a product and that product is heirloom tomatoes. And so last year we got together and we re retrofitted some um, high tunnels. We made a big investment in propane and we were able to produce an heirloom tomato before Easter. Okay. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. That year-round productivity is priceless. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And, but, you know, people in this region don't have a problem with paying $4.85 a pound for a tomato. Mm -hmm. Heirloom tomato. That's of good quality. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tony. All right. Terry, please. Yeah. yeah, I agree with everybody, what everyone said on the panel. Um, only I, I would like to add is, um, I mean, the will is there. Um, the you know the want to is there. It's just the the funding for it, right? right. Mm -hmm. uh, we got right. so many. Um, you can just ride on 70 East and see how many abandoned warehouses we got, and things of that nature. 
Um, yeah, we would love to, um, you know, get one of those buildings and flip it out and turn it into an indoor space. But um, just need some people to, um, I guess, invest in that and um, and educate on that. You know, we, um, you know, we, we so used to the outdoor thing. What I do like about it is I know the NRCS has a equip program where you can get a caterpillar tunnel. So I have a caterpillar tunnel in the city. And a lot, I see a lot of farmers and growers are getting caterpillar tunnels now. So it's basically like a greenhouse, you know, um, so that could be um, a year-round thing. But like I said, the need is there. We got all the space there. Um, we got a lot of policy changing right now. I know we had we had LRA properties at one point in time. Um, that's Land Revitalization um, Authority. That's what we had here. They just changed that like, like a month ago. Um, one of my properties in the city is from an LRA property. Uh, that's where you pay $5 for five years as long as you grow food. Uh, so that's changing now because they want to they do more um, commercial uh, you know, investors to come in. Mm -hmm. But if we had the LRA properties, I don't know why they stopped the program. It was working. But uh, if we had that program with all these vacant lots, we, we have the opportunity to put more what, geothermal greenhouses on, mm -hmm. on that land or any, any other um, type of high tunnel or, or, or glass greenhouse or capital tunnel, whatever that may look like. But um, can be stacked. Yeah, right. container okay. stacked too mm -hmm. as well. But um, so, you know, we can, uh, I guess, get the opportunity to... Um, I tried to purchase that land at the LRA property, but they wouldn't allow me to because uh, they want they want uh, commercial investors to come in and um, do that. So if we can get some people to help, um, I guess, lobby or talk on our behalf or something, they can open up that program again, or you know, um, or some investors that want to look into um, getting some of these vacant warehouses and turn them into a into a growing space. That'd be, you know, something that I wish for. <clears throat> Thank you, Terry. And uh, I was given. Uh a little bit time time warning. We didn't get a chance to get to our third question, but indeed, our panelists sharing actually already touched some of the challenges. We already heard challenges, for example, the high initial cost, right, of indoor farming facility and technologies, the need for financing, you know, to help uh, with the startups, the uh, education for workforce. Um, I, th I think we're hitting the time. Uh, let's give another uh, round of applause for all the panelists. Yeah. And uh, I'm sure many of us will, uh, uh, will continue being here. So feel free to reach out to any of us if you want to uh, have further chats. Thank you all. Thank you, Hightower, and your entire panel. Thank, Thank you. you. One of the things that we try at AGS to do as much as possible is to bring together researchers and practitioners to talk to each other. And I know that all of you who go to conferences all the time, you, get, you don't get to see that very often, but this was a great discussion, and I think it was a wonderful panel. <laughs>